Hello, and welcome to the Nonfiction Authors Podcast, where we interview experts who help you learn how to write, market, publish, promote, and profit from your book. The podcast is brought to you by the Nonfiction Authors Association.com, which is the home of the Nonfiction Writers Conference.com. We have several membership levels, all of which offer discounts on our live courses and so many other benefits. Find out more at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com slash join. I'm your host, Carla King, and I always appreciate you spending your valuable time with me each week with our expert guests who help you with at least one or more of the many tasks of writing, marketing, and promoting your books and your business. Today, you're going to learn how to use a virtual or author assistant to avoid burnout and grow your business. This week's guest is Katie Santoro. Hi, Katie. Hi. And let me tell you a bit about her story as a business burnout survivor on a mission to help others avoid the same by offering virtual assistance to business owners and busy professionals. In 2019, after a long period of corporate burnout, Katie left her job to run a yoga studio. Then when the pandemic began, like a year later, she took the studio completely virtual, but began considering a return to corporate life so she could continue to pay rent on the empty studio. Knowing she couldn't return without risking another burnout, she combined years of experience in the legal and insurance industry, blended it with her experience running a small business, and began assisting clients as a freelancer. Then her business grew, so she recruited assistance from her network of friends who had left the workforce because it was so difficult to find childcare during the pandemic, and River City Virtual Assistance was born. Now she and her team of trained virtual assistants assist clients in a wide array of industries with everything from basic administrative tasks to marketing and website building. River City is dedicated also to providing reliable, consistent, and intelligent assistance to clients and is committed to providing meaningful, flexible employment to individuals within the USA. So welcome again, Katie. And I just want you to know, everybody, that you know, I invited Katie to the podcast after having, after the NFAA hired a part time assistant, Elise. I'll just uh, tell you, she's so awesome and so experienced. And we're so impressed with the level of expertise and efficiency of your business and of Elise that I wanted to share our experience with our audience. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you're here. So first of all, let's define a virtual assistant. So virtual assistants are always virtual. Um, In today's world with Zoom and video communication, it just makes it so easy. Um, There's a couple of different ways that they work. Um, Some of them are freelancers. Some of them are agencies like us. Um, So you can either hire someone through the agency or directly as a freelancer. Um, They are completely virtual. Some do. I've run across a couple who have a physical office, so they bring all of their um, assistants into a physical office and they work together, but they work, they do their client work virtually. Um, And then, of course, the other option is overseas offices where they're in offices overseas, but it's outsourced to them. So maybe the assistant might not always be virtual with their team, but they're always virtual to their client. Let's just go through everything a VA can do. Uh, first of all, and then we'll go we'll go through what you shouldn't be asking them to do, and then how to find, hire, and train, and delegate, and communicate, and problem solve. But you know, let's just start with the basics. Your VA can do a variety of things. Um, kind of thinking from a a basic admin standpoint, one of the things we get asked a lot about is email management and calendar management. So, kind of being the gatekeeper through email and calendar. Um, And then they can do, you know, we have, we have assistance to do event planning and those events don't naturally have necessarily have to be virtual, they can be in person, as long as they can plan them virtually. Um, We do a lot of vacation planning, travel planning, um, and then note taking and transcription research, light project management. Um, And then we can help with social media when it comes to kind of your content management, taking your content and spreading it over your different social channels. We can build out email campaigns. We can work on your CRMs. We work on learning management systems to build out um, courses and programs. 
And then of course, a little bit of website and blog updates. Um, the kind of next level up of VA, once they have some experience, they can do process formation, operational formation, and, um, and help you execute your business development plans. Yeah, that's a lot. And I suppose um, when when somebody comes to you, they ask you to find somebody who can do what they want instead of having to interview themselves, which I know is a very difficult task to get the right person. Yes. And and the way that we work, we work kind of as a group. So um, we work together to train each other. So if there's something that your assistant maybe doesn't know how to do, we can always have somebody train them to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's a nice thing of working with agencies. Usually agencies provide that supporting and that training behind the scenes to the assistant. Right. And then we also at the Nonfiction Authors Association, you know, have a resource list of author assistants, which are author virtual assistants. Mm -hmm. And um, we ask them to upload books to Ingram Spark and Amazon, do social media. Can you think of anything else? Um, That funnel, that email funnel is really important and it's very confusing for a lot of authors and they just don't want to deal with hooking up the API from the email list to the book funnel to um, maybe the pay hip or another e-commerce system, right? Yeah, kind of creating all those different, you know, if you're using Zapier, creating all those different apps and making sure everything is running smoothly, um, testing it. it takes a lot of brain power to learn those systems and and to load all the information into them, like to build out your emails and then to also test them. So your virtual assistant can come in and, and do that for you so you can use your brain power on your other things like writing. writing and business. And I'm glad you mentioned Zapier because a lot of authors, especially just don't even know uh, Zapier exists and Zapier. Uh, can you just explain what that is very quickly? Sure. So it's a, uh, um, there's apps, they connect one program to another program um, and they can't, they can't connect all programs. So it can't do whatever you want it to do. They have specific apps that they set up. So it can do things like um, when they make a purchase on Amazon, it can automatically put them into your MailChimp. Um, so things like that, automatically kind of moving them through the sales process. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So there's so having- much Zapier can do. And, uh, you know, it takes it takes a lot of training and also a lot of patience uh, to get the APIs, which are the, you know, I, I always um, compare APIs to your routing and account numbers on your bank. So you have to go get that to pay your bill and then you have to connect it to a few other things. And then you can automatically deliver your uh, book ARCs and all of that. And having help with that is just, you know, it's, it does free you up a lot to do your business and your writing. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll talk about delegating that in a minute, but I know people are wanting to know, how do you find the right VA and hire them and train them? So that's, that's a big question. So take it one step at a time, please. Absolutely. So there's, there's different ways Um, you could go through an agency um, and there's a lot of agencies. You can Google VA agency. Um, I think you have to kind of decide first if you want your VA to be US based or overseas and just kind of be cognizant of that. Some agencies are US based, but then they outsource overseas, which is great. A lot of times that's a great way to find a really technical VA, someone who can really like dive into your Zapier or your CRM management. Um, and then, so there's their agencies and then there's freelancers. So you can find freelancers through organizations like yours. I know that you guys have a list of um, of freelancers. You can find them on Upwork. You can find them on Fiverr. And I've seen people just kind of reach out on LinkedIn and say, who are you using and getting recommendations that way? Yeah, that's a good way. Recommendations are the best for sure. Mm -hmm. And then hiring them, um, you know, uh, some people get paid by PayPal. I know you do billing. I mean, what are the the various ways and maybe what should you watch out for if you're hiring somebody on your own and you don't really know what you're doing yet? Yeah. I think, I think the most important thing, especially if you're going just with a freelancer is, is there a contract in place and what does that contract look like? That's going to not only, I guess, protect you, but also give you guidelines of what to expect from them. So how they bill, how often they bill. um, And then, you know, do they have things 
in their contract or do you have a contract where you can require, you know, a response within a certain amount of time or, you know, is there a, a guarantee on the work or something along those lines? So you're kind of, you know, going with a freelancer, you want to make sure that you have those boundaries in place to protect both of you, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Contracts are awesome. The more detailed, the better. I mean, not that it has to be 10 pages, but I find there may be two or three pages, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and also beyond the contract, you know, having that conversation when you, when you onboard them, what you expect, the hours that you expect, um, Mm -hmm. the style of communication that you expect those things. I mean, I think open communication on Mm -hmm. your your onboarding and beyond is the most important part of that relationship. Yeah. And I want to get into that at the end because I have some uh, insights from working with the lease and it's just, it's kind of amazing um, to have a good virtual assistant and the communication, um, but when let's continue talking about onboarding. So onboarding is uh, how do you how do you train them? I mean, because a lot of times we don't know what we don't know. Like we say we need a funnel, but we don't need know that we need PayHip and 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 Book Funnel and Zapier and Mail or Light or Constant Contact or whatever. So how do you train somebody when you you don't even know what they're supposed to be doing sometimes? A a good virtual assistant is going to know those things. And that's something that you would kind of discover in the, um, in the interviewing process. So asking them, what is your experience? Have you done similar roles to this? What CRMs have you worked on? What is your technology background? What programs are you familiar with? Um, And then in the onboarding process and beyond, you really want a VA that's going to be able to partner with you and come to you with new ideas and thoughts. So I think even a good question in the the interview process is what are your resources? You know, are you taking courses online? Do you have um, an organization that you're part of where you could ask questions to other people? You want someone who's out talking to other VAs and getting ideas and learning the different all of the different programs. There's so many programs. There's so much noise right now. Um, but yeah. So, so I just want to relay to you. I, it just occurred to me. Um, one writer came to me uh, a few weeks ago and she said, Oh, I hired this VA and she seemed really good, but you know, and we're going to, this is actually going to number five communication <laughs> problem solving. Um, she, she didn't give her, uh, it turned out she, she hired her, but she didn't give her the result of what she wanted. She said, um, you know, I want you to help me with my social media. She didn't say, um, I want you to, and she didn't know anything about Canva either. And she didn't say, I just want you to replace all my social media headers with a new one. And you know, that she said, I just want you to handle my social media. And then she didn't get the results that she wanted. So she didn't know how to train her. Um, So I guess we'll just jump to communication and problem solving. And then, you know, I kind of coached her through what she, you know, should be telling the, the, the talking about the outcome and not the process. And I hope that she's resolved that with the current VA, because I don't think that was the VA's fault because she didn't have a, a goal, right? Right. And the, the outcome is so important. Um, you know, when we do our onboarding calls, that's one of the things we ask is what is, what is the purpose of this? What are your goals? What are your missions and your values? Bringing your VA into that kind of level of the culture of your, of your organization or of your project allows them to think a couple steps ahead and really see why they're doing it. Um, it's, mm-hmm getting bogged down in tasks is one thing, but you want your VA to be, to partner with you with ideas. And they can't do that unless they know the full goal and, you know, projected outcome. Like what are the results I want? I want a beautiful new header. That's the same across all my social media sites. That's kind of all you should actually say. And then you should leave the the details to them. Right. I mean, maybe they need to set up branding in Canva with your colors and all of that. I know I worked with, um, Elise to, um, you know, set up that, uh, branding section of Canva so that all of our social media would have the right fonts and the right colors and sort of the same design elements. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and that took a while to get to just for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, all of it, I think of all of it as relationship building, right? Like you want to spend time with your assistant to get to know them and then Mm -hmm. to get to know you and your organization. And from there, like it's, you know, getting to know you and getting to know your brand, they're more able to go in and brand your things properly. So. Exactly. And she often just comes up with designs on her own and says, okay, is this, we needed this, is this good? And we're like, 
Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for not bothering us with the details of that. Um, so we've effectively delegated a lot to our, our uh, assistants in social media and website development. Um, and we're still learning. So I could use your tips on how to effectively delegate for the best ROI on our time together. So we're not wasting time on processes that we don't need to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, the kind of the best way to delegate is make a list. I always say, like, do a brain dump session, right? And it's great to do a brain dump session with your assistant saying, these are all the things that I have going on right now. And what can you take off my plate? Chances are they're going to jump in and be like, oh, I can do this. I can do that. I can't do this, but I can learn this for you. Like, I feel like most virtual assistants are pretty curious and they want to learn new things. They want to learn new skills. So giving them that, like, these are all the millions of things I need done is going to give them a point to start from and let you know what they can and can't do. Um, Like we said, providing context. Every time you're delegating, you want to provide context on what they're doing, why they're doing it, and the final goal. Um, I love to set priority levels. I use a P1 to P3, P1 being like, do it today, P3 being like, ah, do it this week. Um, So giving the priority levels is a great way. It cuts back on some of the back and forth communication. It cuts back on a lot of frustration, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, Setting your VA up for success. So um, when you're delegating to them, making sure that they're in your systems, they have access to your CRM, they're in the email that they need to, they have access to your branding board on Canva, they have access to your project management system, anything they need access to, make sure they're in and make sure that they're in fully. So if there's a um, a two-step authentication, make sure that you're doing that over the phone so that you can get that authentication. Um, And then it's, you know, communicating, which we'll we'll talk about a little bit further. Um, And then, you know, debriefing. So when you guys have meetings or, you know, get to the end of a project, you want to debrief that project and say, these are the things that went well. These are the things that didn't go well. And this is how we solve that in the future and make them go more smoothly next time. Oh, I haven't done that. I need to do that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You know, that is, I know I do it with other projects, but I haven't done that with assistance yet. So thank you for that. And then just a note about um, security. So assistants have access to our, you know, our Stripe and our PayPal and, you know, our bank accounts sometimes and all of our social media accounts. I know um, there is a level of trust and uh, that you need, but you also need to build in safeguards. And I've used LastPass in the past, and there's all, all kinds of password manager systems. What do you have to say about trust and verification and sharing? Yeah, we love last last pass. It's great. It works really, really well. Um, when it comes to like, if you're giving them credit card information, you want to use a credit card. Don't use your debit card. It's easier if there's a problem mm-hmm. there to cut that off. Um, when you are giving them access to anything on the admin side, like your CRM or anything, look at those different levels of settings. There's always like a you know just an admin, and you can kind of control what they can and can't access. Mm-hmm. Same with your QuickBooks. If you have them helping with um, you know, invoicing, you can set what they can and can't see. So knowing those settings and setting them appropriately is a really great way. Um, and then talking to them about what their security measures are. For instance, we use two-factor authentication in our um, Google Drive. It's just, it's a requirement. And you can always, if you really want to be extra comfortable and all do all the due diligence, you can ask for a background check. They're relatively mm-hmm. cheap to run, about $30 a check. And you know, oh. if you're giving them a lot of financial information, I, I think it's worth the peace of mind. I did not know that. Where do you get a background check? Do you just Google oh. background check and just... Yeah, I'll have to send you up? a link. Yeah, we, <laughs> okay. we have some of you. I'll send you a link. I don't know it off the top of my head. Great. We'll just we'll yeah. just put that link just for the record in the show notes so everybody has access to it for the episode page. And I just wanted to back up a little bit and talk about LastPass and password managers and what they do. Could you provide that information for us? Yeah. So LastPass is a program. It's usually a paid program when you get to, I think, a certain amount of passwords um, and you have all your passwords in it. And then you give access to your your assistant. You can give them access to which ones you want. You don't have to give them access to all of them. But it's kind of like if you use Password Manager on Google, it just auto populates those passwords for you. So they get that auto population for the 
the websites that you granted them the auto population for. So it's a password sharing program. Yes. And, you know, when I, when I use uh, somebody from Fiverr, for instance, which, you know, they might have a thousand one-star reviews, but really I have no way of tracking them and they live in another country and I could never track them down if they, you know, they were a bad actor. Um, I just press give uh, the button that, that says give them access, but don't let them see the password. So you can let them see the password or not see the password. I also, by the way, have my parents on LastPass and I share, we share. And it's just, it's just a lifesaver because I know I'll always have their credit card information and their medical information if anything happens. So um, it's, it just helps me breathe a sigh of relief in every aspect of my life. That's a great idea, Carla. <laughs> it's a great idea to keep track of parents. <laughs> Keeping track of parents, yes. Uh-huh. Um, and then, um, you know, Elise came to us and she knew Trello. I wanted to go back to skill sets and she knew Trello, but not Asana. And Asana is much more complicated than Trello, but you can, you know, it's a Trello-like um, what would you call Trello and Asana project management software? Yeah. And it took her like 10 minutes to, to learn it. So it's just really, I, I mean, even if the uh, VA doesn't have the specific tools that you need, I think it's worth mentioning that there are so many tools. Like she, I think she had used Buffer, but not Hootsuite, right? And they're, they're all so similar. And I know it sounds like, flippant to say, oh, well, they're all the same. They're they're pretty similar. If you've used Trello, you can figure out Asana. And it's not necessarily about using the program. In that case, it's it's more the analytical skills of setting up the project management properly, you know? So it is. And then same with, yeah. And same with all those calendaring things. It's a it's a calendar and you schedule it. It's you know pretty feel safe. Right. And so, so this is funny. I keep loading stuff on. I, so I asked her, I asked her to do uh, social media management and I don't know, some other things. And these are things that would have, they, they would take me a very long time because I'm just not using them every day and all of that. And she comes back the next day and she says, I'm finished. What, what, what else? And I'm like, wait, how could you have possibly finished that quickly? So I do feel like there's a really great return on investment for a, um, a higher level, more highly paid, um, assistant than a sort of a junior or somebody who's just not as experienced because they get it done in half the time. It's really incredible. Yeah. And there is at the beginning of, of any work with a client, there's going to, it's going to take them a little bit longer as they get to learn your systems and your work style and your processes. But, you know, I think the first month is a little bit bumpy. And then, you know, I would say probably the first 90 days, there is that learning curve just as to like communication styles and culture. But once you get past that, you know, the things that they can take off your plate and the the time that they can free up for you is that's really where you see your return on investment. And I'll also say that I'm constantly asking her, I was like, what is, you know, are you enjoying this part? What is fun for you? Right. Because I don't want to lose her to, you know, having her do, um, stuff that she hates to do. And if we can have another VA, maybe a lower pay VA, who's just an expert in one thing that she can kind of manage, I'm all for that as well. Yeah. And that's great. Like asking your assistant what they enjoy and keeping them engaged. Nobody wants to work in, you know, a job that they don't really enjoy. And you see that come through in the work product. So that's, you know, part of the communication. Like, do you like it? Do you want to learn something new? Mm -hmm. Are you bored? You know, learning those things. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're almost at the end, but I want, I would love to hear any last tips that you have and also um, share your your URL and your social media handles or um, places where we can get more information about you or just generally hiring uh, VAs or advice that you have? Yeah. Um, So I'm at our our website is rivercity-va.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. It's just Katie Santoro, K-A-T-I-E-S-A-N-T-O-R-O. 
feel free to reach out via LinkedIn or, you know, via, there's a link on our uh, website to schedule a call with me. I'm always happy to talk about what we can do, what we can't do, give you any ideas. If we're not the right fit for you, I can give you some recommendations for better fits for you. Um, And yeah, I think, you know, just going into it, going into a relationship with a VA, having good expectations and good boundaries knowing what you need before you go into it. Don't expect your VA to tell you these are the things you need done. Um, You do want them to strategize with you at at a certain level, but when you first get started, know that you need to have a couple of things for them to start with to really get started and get the ball rolling. Yes, great. So thank you so very, very much for sharing your expertise. I really appreciate what you do, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. We we love doing what we do. So I'm glad that we can help your organization. And I want to thank our listeners for joining us today and every week for a list of guests and topics. Just check our schedule on the site, use your favorite search engine, or better yet, sign up for our mailing list at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com. And remember, keep writing. The world values your experience and expertise. Until next week. Thanks. Hey, just a couple more things. I want to give a shout out to our awesome sponsors and partners, which you can find in our resources section, along with a huge list of experts who can help you with every aspect of your publishing journey. Thanks again for your time. And please join us each week by subscribing to our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast audio app.